All right. Well, thank you everyone again for joining this session. Um, as more people are joining, uh, my name is Michael Pearson. I'm uh, happy to be leading the International Humanistic Management Association and uh, get to have conversations like this with David and Dennis today, I facilitate those. Uh, I think they're critical in our sort of joint endeavor to transform business and business education and ultimately create a world that works for everyone. Um, and I think one of the key pieces there has been the mindset and understanding that that guides us in terms of how we organize ourselves economically and societally. And so Dennis Snower is uh, in my home country, Germany, a very famous and known person that does not need any introduction, but he led the uh, Kiel Institute for um, World Economics for a long time and is now leading a global solutions initiative and is affiliated with various uh, universities and has been committed to really like this, this work, I believe. So we're, we're here more from him. That's the great thing. And his partner in crime, David Sloan Wilson, I think is no, uh, no unknown to this community. And I thank David for being here and for making this conversation possible. So David has been a distinguished professor of biology and anthropology at, at Binghamton University and uh, is now leading the nonprofit Pro Social World. Um, it, I think, is a great transdisciplinary effort that we need at this point that we'll hear about from both David and Dennis in a moment. And I invite everybody here to share their questions in the chat. I'll be uh, asking the beginning uh, some general questions, and then we'll try to make it available for everybody here to ask. Um, and the point of this conversation that is an ongoing conversation that will also invite you to continue at our conference June 3 to 7 at Fordham University. And uh, we'll put the link in in a moment for those of you that are not aware. I want to make sure that we give credit to our sponsor, the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility. Erica Steckler couldn't be here at this point. She may be on uh, while driving, but I, I want to thank them for making this possible. So, David, uh, Dennis, who wants to kick us off? Thank you both for I being here, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. I think I'm going to kick it off and quickly pass to Dennis. And the the, the idea is to is to uh, leave lots of time for for Q and A. But uh, so our title is a new paradigm for humanistic management, I believe. And I'm going to talk about the paradigm part, the basic concept of paradigms. And then Dennis is going to describe the new paradigm that we've been working on for a period of about four years. Uh, so, and then Michael, we're going to bring you in because uh, to see what this means for management and especially for humanistic management with lots of opportunity for, for uh, input. And so the best way for me to introduce the concept of a paradigm in the first place, that's a very commonly used word and, and so commonly used that I think it's lost its meaning. We throw that word around a little bit too much. And um, I just finished a podcast, recording a podcast with uh, Raj Sisodia and Bob Chapman, who are leaders of the conscious capitalism movement. That movement is quite closely allied with humanistic management. And But Bob Chapman related, he's the CEO of Barry Waymiller, a manufacturing company. And if you don't know about that story, then than you should, but uh, he was saying that he has business leaders come to observe the way his companies work. And what they say again and again and again is that I have never seen anything like this, they say. I have never seen anything like this. And the reason for that is not that things like that don't exist, it's that they can't see it because of, because of the way they think about business. They have the current business paradigm represented by Milton Friedman, the shareholder value model. You all know all about that. That's that's the lens through which they see the world. And that lens orients their perception so strongly that it literally blinds them to practices, which in the first place make sense from other perspectives. And in the second place, manifestly work, not just for the performance of the company, but for the well-being of everyone associated with the company. So if they have never seen anything like that, that's due to the paradigm, the lens through which they're seeing the world. And if there's another paradigm, another lens, then we want to know that. That's like a first order of business 
is to adopt the right lens through which we become blind or we see. And so what Dennis and I claim is that there actually is a new paradigm and it's based on um, a combination of evolution and, and complexity in the, in the scientific uh, sense of the world. And when you see it, uh, the world through the lens of the new paradigm, then most of what makes sense to the people on this audience, because they already have a humanistic lens, that's why you're here, it will be a great fit, a so much more of a better fit than having to overcome the neoclassical um, neoclassical paradigm. And then a final point before passing to to um, uh, Adanis is that for people that are alienated by their current dominant paradigm, uh, what do they have? Often what they have is what Dennis and I call diffuse pluralism. In other words, they have a perspective that doesn't have the kind of integration of a paradigm. And they come by it so many different ways. I mean, Bob Chapman comes by it by his Christian faith. Um, Rosh Sisodia comes by it by his Indian heritage and upbringing. Um, people in this audience might come by it by humanism. Um, everyone, it seems, has a different path to this uh, perspective. And that's not the same as having something that counts as an authoritative theoretical foundation. And of course, they're, they're, um, nothing can be as authoritative as, as a combination of complex system science and evolutionary science. And so the formal theoretical background as a foundation is a very important improvement over what we call diffuse pluralism. Uh, and uh, so a thousand critiques of the neoclassical paradigm are not going to budget there has to be something with more substance and integration. So I feel that what I've said is like maybe kind of not as articulate as I might like it to be, but but um, I'll now pass to Dennis for, to describe what we mean by a new uh, a paradigm for seeing seeing the world far more conducive to humanistic management than the current uh, neoclassical paradigm. Okay, well, thank you very much, David. Um... And uh, I, uh, your enthusiasm is always a catching, although I've got loads of it from myself. I think for this crowd, the best way to start is with a question, what does it mean to be human? Um, humanism is about being human. And um, I have been an economist uh, for uh, most of my life. And for an economist, what it means to be human is to be a machine that maximizes your utility subject to your constraints. Uh, and your utility that tells you what things, largely consumption goods, you prefer to others. And basically what you do is you choose the things that you most prefer from all the stuff that you can afford, and that's it. Um, then you have fulfilled your role as a human being. And if you come back, as I often have uh, ever since I was an undergraduate, saying, well, isn't there more to life than this? They'll say, yep, but it's not economics. And um, I think that has done a huge amount of damage because economics is a wide field that encompasses much of politics, um, as we know, and, uh, uh, and it has invaded our thinking in many other disciplines. So if you think that's what it's all about, then you're going to have an impoverished understanding of what it means to be human. And uh, that is what blinds you to these other things, as um, David has said. So. Furthermore, I mean, what economists consider to be human is you maximize your own individual utility function. Um, and what your preferences are, they are hardwired in your brain and you just uh, calculate the best thing you can do to satisfy those. So there are no sort of natural connections between people at the level of preferences. And aside from that, um, 
people are greedy, they want as much consumption as possible, and they're lazy, and they don't want to work, um, they want to work as little as possible for it. And that's what explains what it's all about. Now, the new paradigm that David and I um, have developed basically has a wider conception of what it means to be human. And it's virtually embarrassing uh, for me to run through these um, points to this crowd because it'll sound so obvious um, uh, as it must uh, to anyone who hasn't been completely brainwashed um, by uh, economic theory. Um, the first is that humans are not just individuals, um, they are social creatures. In fact, it's very difficult to understand anybody who defines herself or himself just in completely individualistic terms. That's basically psychopathic. You define yourself in terms of the people that you interact with, those that you love, those that you respect. It's some... Um, most of it is about social connections. And uh, therefore, unless you understand those social connections, you really shouldn't be able to understand anything about economics, although economics is generally um, portrayed as something completely separate uh, and running all on its own. So putting, uh, taking the economy as embedded uh, in a society, embedded in a polity, um, is terribly important for us. And what do I mean by embedding? Well, it means that when we live, when we make economic decisions, we not only act on our own behalf, um, but we also act as participant in a larger whole. Um, you know, we are all children of somebody, we are colleagues, um, we could be co-congregants, uh, we um, have fulfilled many different roles. And all these roles, uh, all the social roles involve us with other people. And when we fulfill these roles responsibly, we participate in the well-being of the collective to which we belong. So, you know, everybody has your family. If your family means something to you and your family thrives, then you participate uh, in its well-being. You flourish when it flourishes. And that's something completely absent from economics. And the second thing that's completely absent in economics um, is this understanding that the world is far too complex for us really to understand. And therefore, the best we can do is experiment, see what works, and then go with um, what has worked. But in the process of doing so, we change the world. And then we need to do more of the same. So at every stage of the process, where we are living in a, a world that basically it's incomprehensible. If you look at it like an economist saying, the only imperfect information we have is probabilistic. That is, I know the probabilities that everything will happen. Then all that remains for you to do are these um, standard probabilistic calculations. And we impose this on ev virtually everything that we see. I mean. Weather forecasts give you the probability of rain. Um, rain is an emergent phenomenon. It doesn't have probabilities um, and uh, so forth. Uh, an insurance company will give you the probability that something will happen to you. Um, the, all these things blind us to something important, which is they blind us to our ignorance. And when you understand the the range of your ignorance, where it lies and where it does not lie, then you can make provision. It's just like when you're in the dark, your pupils expand and you look around when you hear a scary sound in the dark, um, you are alert uh, and you're ready to respond uh, in ways that you would not be um, if uh, you uh, were in a different context. And therefore, Ignorance is really important. And so uncertainty, the radical sense, is really important. And so we live in a world where 
there are many different types of individuals and many different types of groups. There's variation in the way people respond to challenges they face. And then there's selection, which is that some of these responses turn out to be better than others. And those that succeed are the ones that get selected and transmitted. This has worked and it um, tends to spread. Now, the, this I think is sort of a general rule of life. And the only problem with it is that quite often we don't realize where the scale and the scope of our challenge lies. And we form collectives that are inappropriate to that. So take climate change. Okay. Climate change, that's a global problem. There is only one scale at which you can uh, address it properly, which is uh, on a humanistic level. We are human beings uh, in the same boat and we face a common problem. And therefore, we need to deal with this in the spirit of our common humanity. Uh, if we have a family rift, then obviously it's a smaller social network and you need to deal with it at that level. But instead of thinking in this way, nations say, well, I'm going to see what's good for us. Uh, and then we will make international climate negotiations dependent on that. That can't possibly lead you in the right direction, um, much as some um, cancer cells proliferating in your body um, are not going to uh, lead to bodily health. And so to understand what we call, what is the right level of functional organization? How do you need to organize yourself functionally in order to respond appropriately to the challenge? That's really important. And then to know that we're social creatures we have the ability to do this, but um, it needs to be managed in an appropriate way. We shouldn't be like cancer cells. Um, we should be like uh, cells that perform uh, a useful role in the, in the body. And all these things have really big implications for the way we act. Um, uncertainty, for example, means that what you should not do is what economists do is agree on one model and then apply it to just about anything. Because that's a monoculture. That's as bad as monocultures uh, in biology. Um, it doesn't, it, it makes you less resilient. It blinds you to things that you've overlooked. So instead of that, you really want theory pluralism. You want what we call cognitive diversity many different ways of understanding the world, all of which are evidence-based, but contradict one another. Because then the next time a surprise comes up, you'll be, you'll be ready for it. You'll say, oh, well, wait a minute. I've got another map that might help me here um, instead of the one that I've been using so far. So theory pluralism is really useful. And the other big implication of this is that our decisions are very deeply dependent on context. Uh, and so we can create cooperative, collaborative contexts, so we can create adversarial ones. Um, quite often we can create contexts that force people to compete with one another. You know, these teenagers who self-harm because they don't have as many likes or followers on their social networks as, as others. Did they ask for this, to be involved in social networks that ranks them in according to likes and followers? No, no, that was imposed on them by digital monopolies um, who managed to make profits this way. So if we understand uh, what it is um, that... Uh, that, that decisions are made on the basis of the context that we create and the responsibility we have for creating contexts that enable us to address our collective challenges, then we are way ahead of the game. And so I've already talked too much, but there's just one last thought I want to leave you with, which is that economists are way off when they say it's all about utility and utility is all about consumption. Because what makes you thrive is a lot more than what you consume. 
and if you are a social animal, then you need social solidarity. You need these social connections. Um, and the other thing that you really need is agency, uh, an ability to shape your life through your own efforts. Um, so, you know, if I threw you all into solitary confinement and then asked you, okay, now how much in the way of consumption do I have to give you to make you just as well off as you were before, um, economists could make perfect sense of this because um, things are substitutable in the utility function, but you know there's something really wrong um, with giving you this choice. There's nothing that uh, could compensate you for the entire loss of sociality and agency. Um, and therefore, to measure things differently, and that was one reason why the team that I started developed the SAGE dashboard, S-A-G-E stands for Solidarity, Agency, Material Gain, and Environmental Sustainability. Four different things that we need um, absolutely in order to thrive. And if we could measure them <coughs> and report on them uh, and uh, see success in those terms, we would be in a completely different world. Okay, I've uh, uh, talked too much and done, I really look forward to uh, to our interactions because it has huge implications for management processes because management is all about creating the right context. Management is about understanding where the uncertainties lie. Um, and it is also about understanding where business is not the most appropriate level for making decisions. Uh, and uh, therefore, um, let me just say this one last thing and then I promise to shut up. Uh, which is, um, I've just um, finished, um, come back from Washington, D.C., where I ran a, a round table around the question of what rules should policymakers and businesses compose together so that businesses can compete for profit while at the same time regenerating the environment and promoting their communities. Now, that is not a question that policymakers can answer on their own. It's not a question that business leaders can answer on their own. Therefore, these um, decision makers need to come together at a higher level of functional organization to do this together and shape a context that is win-win all round. Uh, so lots of implications uh, within and beyond business, but I look forward to discussing this more. That's great. Thank you so much, Dennis. That was a beautiful summary. And I wanted to invite Michael now to talk a little bit about, because we want this to, what does all this mean for management, basically, and humanistic mm -hmm. management? And then I have a few thoughts on my own. So, Michael, why don't you uh, you uh, uh, go next? Yeah, so so thank you and thank you, Dennis, and thank you, David, for this this conversation. I think it's it's a critical one. And uh, yeah, economics dominates. I think most of us know that because it's simple. And uh, what is it? Occam's razor for theory is still in place. So the real challenge is like, what is it that's significant or true enough and simple enough that can replace it? So in terms of this humanistic management conceptualization, what we're focusing on is really what does it mean to be human? Like Dennis, you were saying, right? What is it that we can replace Homo economicus or its advanced versions of the resourceful, evaluative, maximizing man model? And so we are talking and drawing on evolutionary indicators in science in terms of like these drives. Uh, Paul Lawrence worked on that at some point, like the drive to acquire, drive to bond, drive to comprehend and drive to defend as sort of key drivers of ultimate survival and thriving. And you can see that that is actually worn out in the data very nicely. So for us, in terms of management, we are not necessarily talking about the small uh, M management of managing business or manage organizations, but also managing self, managing what it means to be human, <laughs> uh, leading your own lives, managing your own lives, then managing multi-level, managing self, managing uh, others, managing relations, managing organizations, managing society. And I think all of that is what's happening in the context of business schools. We're not just, even though that nomer is that we're talking about business, but it's ultimately a multi-level uh, equipment that they get. Uh, and they use the same lens as you were saying. So what we're hoping to do with this humanistic, there are solutions for, for these balances of these four drives at every level, at the individual, at the relational, at the social, at the organizational, at the societal, at the planetary, and maybe if you want to go beyond as well. 
Uh, and so in that sense, I think we're, we're, we're drawing on that. And the interesting thing, that's where the humanistic notion comes from, is all of the ancient world uh, wisdom traditions have a very similar insight. And so that complementarity, I think, is, is, is critical. We label it humanistic because that's what the Catholics call their Catholic social teaching tradition humanistic. The Jesuits call it their humanism. The Muslim tradition has its version. The atheists have their version. The secularists have their version. But there's this common thread, and I think that's why there's so much connectivity with what you guys are proposing. I, I guess that's where we are sort of working towards. How can we see uh, not just economics, but us in terms of our relationships and how can we manage in a way that we survive and that we can thrive? And so that's very Aristotelian. That's very basic. That's, <laughs> I think where the power of the university comes together uh, of bringing the multiple disciplines uh, to connect at the core of what it means to be human and what do we want and how can we get that. And so utility is a useful concept in that sense, I believe. <laughs> it's just misunderstood. And we're talking about flourishing and well-being as, as a maybe better translation of utility or we are using the term dignity as something that escapes the utility notion, right? And that I think is a critical cornerstone to understanding that there is value that's going beyond exchange and markets have dominated. And I think the neoliberal context is domination of the market without the notion of the state, without the notion of community. And others have worked on that quite a bit that we need to elevate those other principles of organizing that anthropologists and others have worked on quite extensively. Uh, that have served us in our survival. And so bringing government back together as a multi-level, bringing community back into the conversation as a another subsidiarity level, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's where we're working towards with, with the humanistic management idea. And we're not claiming that that's the only idea. Of course, it's just one that can potentially add to the others in terms of conscious capitalism, in terms of B Corps, in terms of all of the, I think, the ideas that we're talking about. And David, you call it the archipelago of multiple things that maybe we can pull together in some way, build build new territory um, and go beyond the diffuse pluralism. So that's the invitation here to connect. And I just wanna throw out for anybody that's interested and excited about that, we're gonna host these also research workshops to translate what Dennis and David are saying from their perspective into the various aspects of leadership management, et cetera. So that's uh, that I'll close. Great, thank you so much, Michael. And I'll only add for a few more minutes and then please be prepared to ask questions and to raise your virtual hand so that uh, we can have a speaking uh, a speaking order. But uh, I put in the chat that a lot of what, what the new paradigm is about uh, centers on the work of Eleanor Ostrom. You might say that uh, Milton Friedman is the icon avatar of the neoclassical economics, and Eleanor Ostrom is the icon or avatar of the new paradigm. And if you uh, review the management literature, you'll see that Ostrom is very little cited, not directly cited. But what you can do is take her core design principles, and you can search the management literature for those core design principles, such as strong sense of identity and purpose, equitable decision making, fast and fair conflict resolution, so on and so forth. And when you do that, as my colleague Paul Atkins has done, so we have a published article on this, you find so much data validating these core design principles. I mean, there's meta-analysis after meta-analysis on the efficacy of these core design principles. And so that's what I mean by evidence hiding in plain sight. We're, we're, there's so much evidence out there that it's like, we don't even need to do additional research, really. Uh, we need to organize our current information. Um, and of course, also um, more, uh, more research, but that's what's needed and what's uh, on offer. And when we do, then what we get is an alignment of science and spirituality uh, that, uh, and humanism that didn't exist before. And I think that Michael, I'm glad that you that you um, uh, showcased all the different spiritual traditions, the different versions of humanism, which are all broadly, uh, broadly similar. To have the scientific framework positively align with that, as opposed to being 
at odds with it. I mean, just think about how huge that is. And so that is what is on offer. And when you do that, then you, you can take the things that are already out there, all these positive examples that are already out there, and they become central. They become exactly what we should be doing and building upon more. And the final point I want to make is that in my experience, which is now not small in, with man, with, in, with, with, in the management field, or what I find is, is that in the first place, more of a disconnect than I would have thought between business school professors and actually advising real corporations. And secondly, corporations, what, what's needed is for corporations to really become more conscious about their cultural evolution, both internally and in their relation with other uh, agents. And it's often that's not easy because of course the companies are swept up in the moment and 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 so on and so forth so there's quite a lot of uh, niche construction or social construction that's needed both on the part of business schools and on the part of of um, actual organizations um, that to to become part of what in my language would be a uh, cultural inheritance system, a worldwide cultural inheritance system for for variation, selection, replication processes, all scales, all contexts, coordinated for the common good. That's like a big social engineering project in order to do it. And it can be done. It can be done bottom up. So any person or organization can just start doing it. They don't have to ask permission. In addition to that, it's really helpful to have what we call enlightened top down. In other words, various capacitating people and organizations who, who see the light, you might say, and are willing to use their capacity uh, rather than dictating command and control, actually to orchestrate this process. And so we talk a lot about enlightened bottom up meets enlightened top down as what we needs to be assembled. So I think that's a, like a grand moonshot cultural construction project that we could all become engaged in. So uh, with that, um, Dennis, do you want to take a turn and then we can go to questions? Um, yeah, uh, just very briefly, there are two things I think that are um, really important, um, which is that when we talk about social engineering, um, it's really important to make sure that it is aligned with people's agency that this is, we participate in social holes, but it, it must be our wish to participate in those holes. Otherwise, um, things can degenerate uh, into something that's truly awful. Um, and we must do so with the requisite humility. Uh, with, we don't know, um, do not understand the world well enough. Um, so that the best we can do is take some good guesses and then hopefully experiment enough and learn from the results of our experiments. The second thing I just wanted to say is when you said this gives us hope of aligning science with spirituality, I think there's something really deep there. Um, the spiritual truths, the virtues that um, have been handed down through the ages, they have one thing that is striking in common, which is they induce us to think in terms of larger collective wholes, to transcend our ego and to uh, give others uh, as much respect and dignity as we give ourselves. And that means that we become responsible members of the groups to which we belong uh, and what it also means is that we should take great care in the way we form our groups, because uh, you can be a very responsible member of a group that does huge damage to other groups. Um, and therefore, just to understand where your place in the larger social and uh, natural ecosystem lies, um, and to be guided then on that basis, um, by the spirituality, the virtues that have been handed down, 
that is um, a form of enlightened spirituality, I think, that uh, our um, paradigm could help promote. So I'd be really interested in discussing these and other matters with all of you. Okay, Michael, do you want to, first of all, I think it would be great to have people to take on a speaking role by, by raising their yeah. hands and actually speaking their questions. And then, uh, Michael, well, maybe I, you I, can... And, and, and I, will I will manage that and support that. I do want to make sure that for the, the size and the group that we are, and I just want to acknowledge we are a global representative group, it seems, from India to Africa to Europe to Asia to, uh, I don't even know, Ken, what time is it in Japan, uh, to the... To the West Coast in the United States. So um, yes, please put the questions there. Make sure that they are questions so that we can answer them, not just comments. You can put comments there too, but we will just sort of have people read them. Um, there, are, uh, from, from my perspective, I just want to point to that, um, well, power structures, I think Liano is sort of talking about power. Um, I do think we need to address power in general uh, and, and, and how to use power. Um, and, and what the framework is for power. I, uh, I want to clarify a humanist, and I think even this evolutionary perspective that we're, that we're talking about here uh, is using power and proposing alternative lenses of the use of power. Uh, and so it, it, is, it is not an absence of power. It's not an ignorance to power. It is really like what we call potentially enlightened that... Uh, <laughs> that there is a, a, a skillful use of power and decision-making. Uh, I think that's maybe more so, right? The, with the core design principles, et cetera. So- yeah. um, Can I make, jump in, uh, Michael, yep. just to reinforce that? Yeah, the core design principles are all about the, the appropriate distribution of power and especially the ability to, to prevent disruptive lower level behaviors. You must be policing as required in order to in order to uh, uh, do this. And if you don't have that, then you have an inappropriate use of, of power. Have, so I'm sure it's problem. required. And if I could say one other thing um, along uh, uh, orthogonal lines, which is that power is impossible to understand without understanding relationships between people. And so understanding where we stand within larger social groups and the relationships we have gives you the force fields whereby power is um, transmitted and received. And a lot of these things are bidirectional. Um, you exert power and you get something back in return. And economics looks at things. It doesn't look at relationships and force fields within these relationships. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's much more like Newtonian mechanics um, than it is uh, uh, quantum mechanics um, or relativity, which is more about relationships between things. So maybe there is here, there's a question here. I think I will start from the top down as I see it. Um, the question that th this knowledge has been around for many, many years. It's not novel totally, but I think there is a new new possibility in terms of the convergence that also David is pointing to, the science at the core, which uh, economics does not draw on, right? Uh, economics has assumptions as the base. <laughs> and, and, and David, and Dennis, what you're proposing here has the science and evidence behind it. Um, I think, Jean, you, you asked the question of how do we collectively shift the neoclassical paradigm, which is the mother for all the citizens' disciplines? Uh, what, 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 what is that's part of the effort here, right? So what are some maybe concrete steps, action steps? And I, I do want to just point out what I got from what you're saying is we're experimenting. We don't pretend to know, right? Evolution, you were saying, Gerard, is evolution of evolution is experimentation. So what are some of the experiments that you might suggest, David or Dennis? Well, no, I'll, uh, go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead, Dennis. Um, much of it is staring in our face, um, which is we have the power to create different contexts. So take, for example, schools. In schools, we force children to compete 
acts against one another as individuals, and then we draw up grades, and we've got a scale as who's done best, who's done worst, um, and that induces them to be status-seeking along those particular lines. We could just as easily put them into groups and induce the, and then measure how well the group does. And uh, that would lead to something very different. And we know in terms of science that leads very different because an individual IQ is very different from a collective IQ. Um, both have been measured um, and collective IQs don't depend um, in uh, very much on the average individual IQs or the highest IQ in the group or so on, but it depends a lot about the relationships between people. And so we could be doing a lot more in the workplace and schools and families to pay attention to these principles um, that uh, enable us to succeed. And in order for that to happen, you need to break out of the shackles that economics has put us in, which is to say, basically, we don't need all these other disciplines. We don't need psychology, anthropology, sociology, what have you, because this is a simple story that will explain everything. And Friedman used the analogy that somebody who plays pool doesn't need to understand the differential equations that explain how the ball moves and spins uh, so that he um, gets the right shot. Uh, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the economists, they've got the differential equations that explain how all of this is happening and um, you don't need any of the rest. You cannot reduce life um, in, this, in this particular way, and you do need insights from elsewhere. And uh, therefore, creating cooperative contexts that enable you to meet the challenges that we have in the world is a big job that governments, businesses um, often ignore. That's one answer, but David, I'm sure. Dennis, I, I want to follow up because you are actually working with the G7 and the G20 summits. In what way are you seeing some receptivity towards these ideas at that level? Well, um, I see both. Um, you see, on the one hand, a realization, certainly at the heads of state level and sometimes at the ministerial level, that there is a very big difference between common problems and shared problems. Uh, common problems are problems that pop up in many different countries, but have to be handled nationally. Like what's the appropriate pension plan uh, you get from the transport system? Shared problems are things like biodiversity loss, financial instability, climate change, um, things of that sort. And shared problems have to be done at a higher level. And People who understand that, they come in trying to contribute at that higher level. The problem is that if you have others who do not contribute at this level, who just want to get the best for their own country, then the entire system, the entire spirit of collaboration tends to unravel. And therefore, we need to do what human beings have always done, which is we need also some external constraints that will enable um, people uh, not to get suckered uh, and to set uh, control bad behavior by um, people who are not acting pro-socially. Um, we, we do this, it's interesting, you know, uh, in a modern economy, we've got laws against theft. Um, and, uh, but if you want to have laws that promote pro-sociality, you run into problems You say, well, I'm impinging on people's liberty. And so uh, I tend to answer, well, let's get rid of the laws against theft. Uh, and then you've got even more liberty. Um, and you can see immediately what's wrong with that. Um, that uh, if you steal, then you make somebody else worse off at your expense since you've got 
um, effects on others that you're not taking into account. Well, the same holds for climate change, the same holds for biodiversity loss and so on. And therefore you need this framework. And it's interesting, I mean, it doesn't receive a lot of attention in economics, but since the Second World War, we've had more and more international treaties and countries binding themselves in various ways. Obviously there's bad behavior as well, just like you have cancer cells in, in the body. Um, but uh, to get a constellation of uh, actors together in the G20 to deal with um, problems collectively, that is something that uh, can pay off enormously. And let me just give you one example and then um, I will stop, which is when I had the privilege of um, running the Think 20, which are all the think tanks of the G20 under Germany's G20 presidency in 2017, um, we were, um, we had the German, the priorities of the German government, we had the priorities of the think tanks, we were in touch with about 500 of them worldwide, and uh, I had uh, people who organized them into lists, and then came a few, a number of suggestions, policy briefs, that did not fit in anywhere, uh, and uh, they received no media attention. Governments thought, you know, what is this? Uh, and it was called, completely irrelevant at the time, it was called pandemic preparedness. And the German government took this on and started making international agreements in the spirit that we've talked about, where this is a collective matter, that stood us in really good stead three years later. So it is possible to make a difference um, at a very small, you know, insignificant micro level where we were um, for a larger whole in ways that you could never predict. I mean, another thing that we did at the same time was do the same for antimicrobial resistance. Now we haven't had a big crisis because um, uh, penicillin doesn't work anymore and so forth, um, but we could. And if it happens, then all the work that is being done to um, help uh, address this problem will come into use. So I think there's a lot that can be done even at that level, um, uh, if you're just aware of the basic principles. That's, uh, thank you. Let's proceed to Donna. Uh, and then uh, uh, I have some points, but I think I can make them uh, after Donna, you make your points. Hi, um, and I did make a, a point recently in the chat and I'm gonna build on that. Thank you so much, I appreciate and really align. And I think many people here do align with the pro-social direction and all the work that's been done for so many years. And also having been in many of these conversations, you well know that people are asking how, how do we build the pathways that move us forward um, more quickly potentially um, and to, to, to overcome some of the barriers that are there and recognizing that it's a messy iterative process. It's not, it, there's no cookie cutter plug and play way of doing this. This is a living in into living lab ways <clears throat> and all of the networking and the various kinds of vehicles that are being used are wonderful. But where I'm going with this is something that I think so few people really know about and it is aligned with the work that our institution is doing because we are patterned as a fair shares commons, uh, which is an incorporation that is already available to bring uh, entities together that, that at, at a, the interdependent layer to, <clears throat> to actually work with the existing laws to build a new uh, kind of incorporation. Um, <clears throat> it does involve working with a lawyer to work through some of the final details, but it's already available around the world. Um, yeah, it hasn't been picked up like, you know, the, the, the best thing since sliced bread, but the readiness is now there to actually do this. And people don't realize uh, by looking into it. And of course, uh, David, I know you're, you're having conversations with, with Graham Boyd, who's one of the kind of key people that's helped to bring some on of this stuff. call on this call. He's on this call. Yeah, yeah. I think he, I think he's here. Um, but as people continually ask, what do we do with this? It's so important to bring that information forward for people to learn about there are building blocks to do this. 
there are ways to, br to bring mission critical efforts together uh, in, in enterprise that, that, that are more interdependent, that bring the different um, stakeholders, sectors, disciplines to do uh, meaningful, mission critical, context-based place sourced work. So it's a it's it's a reconstituting the commons into the fabric of our working society. We need some minimum critical enabling conditions that get us on that path that are also adaptable. Uh, so not a new dogma, not a it's not a methodology. It's not a somebody coming into the world saying, oh, we've got to do it this way. It involves a lot of learning for those that get into it but those become the pathways. And that is the work that that institution is also about. It's about commons. We need lots lots of these things everywhere and where we're Thank not connecting with each other. I'll yes. stop, I've gone too long. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. David. Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, and I think that, um, uh, yeah, the point that I wanted to make before and after is that, um, it's the nature of paradigms. We just start working within the new paradigm. We don't have to justify what we do compared to the neoclassical paradigm. We immediately start operating uh, in the the new paradigm. Anybody could do that, no matter what their capacity uh, is, and um, and then uh, start to uh, uh, start to uh, coordinate. I talk a lot about the archipelago problem. Many islands of thought and practice with little communication among. Islands and what we find. Uh, um, oops, sorry, hold on a second, Adana. And, and uh, so, so many times, so much good stuff going on, but all framed in some kind of way, which it, which it doesn't escape beyond its own borders. And to provide a common conceptual language so that we could understand what we're doing and communicate it more is one of the most important things to uh, one of the most important things to do. And when when we do this, I think it really can have a kind of a contagion that um, and I'm, I'm going back to my conversation with Bob Chapman, who who his company is acquired. They don't use the word acquire. They use the word adopt over 140 other companies and managed to uh, culturally transform them again and again and again. Um, and it's like you would think that would be difficult to change the culture. Um, so many times, um, but the way he describes it is, no, they're starving for this. They're starving for this. I mean, their previous organization was just so bad and so toxic that when you approach them with something which is much more humanistic, they just break down into tears. That's how eager they are to do it. And he used a phrase, which is that caring can be more contagious than COVID. And I think that's a pretty nice prospect to think of, is that when we really do understand caring as something which can succeed, it can be a successful strategy if it's structured in the right way. It can be what wins in a Darwinian world, then it can be as contagious as all of the bad things that spread. And so I think that that's a prospect that, we, of course, we all want. And it's a matter of us getting together, coordinating, learning that common language. And uh, and I think that's what's taking place in front of our eyes. So, and, and I, in the chat, I put the New Paradigm Coalition, which is kind of the online worldwide version of what we're trying to do. Michael put uh, uh, information on the, on the uh, conference, Fordham Conference in New York City. Dennis and I will be in Berlin in early May for the Global Solutions Summit Conference. Uh, we have people on this call. I'll give a shout out to uh, Yosa Niza. They're in, uh, in Slovenia, Romina and the Love uh, Foundation. Um, everyone has some capacity for, for doing this. And I, I really do think that this could become more contagious than COVID. Um, and uh, wouldn't that be something to observe? I, I want to add, there's a couple of, of things that are in the chat, and, and then, uh, Liado, if you have a question, we'll get to you if we have the time. Uh, the um, the conversation about what we can do, I think many of us here are in the domain of business school teaching one way or another. So that's a very clear uh, ask <laughs> to bring that, I think, the pluralistic lens, but l at least this paradigmatic uh, possibility to the attention of, of students. I think they all get it. 
they all know it. I think the the biggest issue may be that the lack of confidence <laughs> of humans to trust their ultimately deeper human instincts, uh, because the world and economics tells them that what humans means is being psychopathic. And, and I think we're very successful in creating that cultural meme. Uh, so we can be equally successful in creating the alternative one. And business schools have been designed to spread that meme. So I think we can we can undo that and redesign and redeploy it. Liana, do you have a question that we can answer? Yeah, I think so. So I, I'm I'm just, you know, I, I'm I'm very interested in in the question of how we go about challenging power. So for example, yeah, you know, the 140 companies that you just mentioned. I'm I'm guessing I could be wrong. Maybe you'll tell me that I'm wrong and you can explain it to me. But I I'm I'm guessing that those corporations so function on the basis of the people who have the ownership make all the important decisions. And uh they allow the folks at the lower level to make important decisions so long as those important decisions don't significantly impact the thing that they care about most which is most of them don't care about the company at all. They only care about what they what shows up in their dividend checks. Um, and- uh, so, so Liano, uh, I know we have we have little but, time and, and, and I think I'm, you're I'm, potentially so reinforcing it. What's the question? Can you put so the, the question? The question, is, the question is, what are we doing? How, how do we go about challenging that kind of a situation when, we, when, when, when everything else that we're talking about is making it easier for them to, uh, to, to maintain that power relationship? No, well, I think that it begins with a pro-social orientation. Um, and first of all, we need to find a way to continue this conversation. That's very, very, very important, is to find a way to continue this conversation. But I think that if, when you have a genuinely pro-social orientation, then you say, basically, I'm trying to work towards the common good. I place that above my individual uh, uh, welfare. And and it's at that where, it, which is not what you just said, Liana, it was not the case that we have leaders that are structuring this, but ultimately they're trying to line their own, feather their own uh, nest. No, that's, they have a much more pro-social orientation than that. They're more genuine in trying to create something that works not only for the benefit of the company, but for the people who make up the, the company. So, and this is another case of fusing the religious spiritual values and because to be religious and spiritual is actually to to regard yourself as part of something larger than than yourself, to subordinate yourself to to that thing, to regard that larger thing as sacred. That's the whole language of spirituality and religion is basically an orientation to we willingly uh, become part of something larger than yourself. And then that's something that we can understand scientifically much better than we ever have before. So, so I'll limit it to that, but uh, please let's structure things so that this conversation can continue within this association by joining the New Paradigm Coalition, by showing up at Fordham, by showing up in Berlin. Uh, let's just make sure that this is a movable feast and doesn't end in two minutes. <laughs> yes. And that's the invitation. Maybe, Dennis, you want to also share your concluding thoughts and invitations, because, yes, this is part of the solution, I think. Uh, conversations like that. And I do think the actions that are happening in that community as part of that, even though it's organized electronically at this point, we're in, in multiple ways, probably all organizing certain communities. And rather than having them be little islands, uh, connecting them further, I think, David, that, that is the, the intention of this conversation. And uh, I think uh, that that will ultimately move the needle. If anything moves the needle, then it's this, right? <laughs> so uh, the kind of con a community or in it works. So Dennis, maybe just some final thoughts and invitations and then. Um, right, final thought and invitation. Uh... It is possible nowadays um, not, uh, you don't have to come to Berlin. You can participate virtually. Uh, Global Solutions Summit 2024. Um, you can find it on the web, you can register for it. And then afterwards, we will have a number of meetings, some of them in person, some of them virtual, um, on uh, what has come out of it. Uh, and we are going to do our best to make sure that uh, we identify the recommendations um, that are pro-social in the appropriate way. Um, there are many ways of being pro-social that benefits a smaller group at the expense of other groups. 
to, to recognize um, where, what appropriate prosociality is, is some um, part of problem solving at the global level. And uh, one last thought that I'd like to leave you with is that none of these things make sense unless we're able to translate it from the macro level right down to the micro individual level. So every global problem or macro problem like climate change must be turned into a micro problem that concerns every individual and some, every individual needs to know. And once we have narratives that translate easily across levels, multi-level narratives, um, that are pulling in the same direction, uh, then we're able to give traction because much of global problem solving um, is good intentions at one level being unraveled at another. Yeah, and I, I'll add just one thing to that because you mentioned micro all the way down to the individual, but the other part of micro is the small group, mm -hmm. the small and appropriately structured group, which has been made invisible by neoclassical economics, but it's in fact, it's a fundamental unit individuals working with their immediate others um, and, um, and with appropriate uh, structure. That's one of the insights of the new paradigm is what we call the cellular level of multicellular uh, society. So individuals will almost always benefit by working in small and appropriately structured groups. Um, and so that's one thing we want to do is to build up the, and that's something anybody can do. Everyone has that capacity because everyone is already working in families, churches, neighborhoods, businesses, schools. Those are the cells that uh, we need to be working at that cellular level and then building up from there. And that, the, and the individuals remain important within those cells. The individuals never lose agency. And so it's, that's, uh, so that's uh, still more. And uh, so, Michael, do you want the last word? Yeah, well, no, I just want to sort of acknowledge that we're two minutes over. Uh, we typically try to be within time. And this is such a fascinating subject. And I want to thank again, David and Dennis for, for being here. And I, I also trust that we can continue this conversation one way or another. I invite everybody that is interested specifically in the research to connect with me or David or others to sort of see how we can use the time at Fordham uh, to do more research on this. There's a lot of pieces that can be done in terms of teaching as well. So please be in touch in this conversation. We'll have other ways uh, to do this as we go forward. Uh, I thank you all for being here. I thank uh, the Donahue Center at the University of Massachusetts for sponsoring this. And um, yeah, we can actually co uh, complete the, the recording and stay on if you wanted to, David, if you want to, and Dennis, if you wanted to continue, then maybe we'll just conclude the official part now and then keep it going.